Isn't it lovely when the live stream starts and you're still doing other things? <laughs> Sorry about that. We ended up, I ended up with a problem on uh, doesn't matter what, and I was just fixing it. But hopefully it is all fixed now and uh, and everything works. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. You know those moments when, um, you know, you're short on time and that's when everything happens? Yeah, yeah, that that's been today, but that's okay because it's been all good things, all inspirations, and lots of different elements that make me um, happy. So, but we're here now. We're here today. It is Friday, which is always lovely, and we have a paper to finish, don't we? A really interesting paper, right? So last week we kind of went down a bit of a rabbit hole with this one, and in the best possible way. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm actually really excited to see where this paper takes us. Um, I hope we have enough time. We have our short on time, so I'm not going to be as chitty chatty as I usually am. But of course, you know me, I can't, I, I can't stop being chitty chatty to a certain extent. So today's paper is the continuation of the distinctive capacities of plants. So this is rethinking difference via invasive species. Um, when we started this paper, I think because we were on this whole conversation piece around invasive invasive species, I was really excited to see where it would take us. I was afraid it would be a little bit technical. But in the end, it's turning out to be a rather well-written, super fascinating paper that talks about invasive species from the perspective of the fact that plants are these independent individual beings. So it's really kind of approaching things um, from another viewpoint, it's really looking at it from the idea that we need a, a diverse, uh, they use the term diverse scholarship, right? We need to rethink of our relationship with plants altogether. And, um, but there's this worry that of course we have this heritage, this way of thinking, this way of being, this paradigm that's in play that is, in ha that is hampering us, really starting with Aristotle when Aristotle originally thought of his, um, uh, scala naturae, which is the idea that plants are on the almost lowest rung of the ladder of the hierarchy of life, because he looks at it as a hierarchy. And it was interesting because this this led to a big conversation here in um, with some of my uh, fellow initiates here at Domenher, where we were talking about the idea of the difference between a scale, like the scala naturale is a scale, as opposed to a hierarchy. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether or not these are two different world words in the sense of, I mean, they obviously are two different words, but I'm saying like for me, a scale is different than a hierarchy because a hierarchy to me implies a pyramid, which means you're always going from top to small, like, and where a scale, yes, it's still level. So none of this applies to plants, by the way, none of it applies to plants. It was, it was on another topic, but the point being that a scale to me implies that you have uh, levels of, for to give it into a positive spin, which is what we were thinking of, it's levels of knowledge that come but that they're open to everyone in the sense that it, there's no limit to how many. So it doesn't have to be a pyramid. It could be that over time, even for example, the bottom rung is really small, but the top rung is huge. So it's not limited where to me, a hierarchy implies a pyramid shape, but is that just my own biases? Who knows? Anyways. So I, I, um, I kind of leave that for your own thinking about it. So, but let me share the paper and let's get into this paper because well, because it was really interesting. And that's what we're here for, right? To get into this interesting stuff. So um, the paper itself is called, as you see, um, the distinctive capacities of plants and rethinking the difference between uh, difference via invasive species. And we were page six. Oh, oops. Hold on, I'm trying to find exactly where we were. I make my notes, uh, and but my, um, yeah. So we had finished going through um, the author's definitions of plants in the sense of, 
Okay, hold on. This is, I forgot that there's this like weird thing with this paper. Okay, so we had gone through these authors kind of expressing plants using their definitions, right? So they were helping us see plants in a completely different way, sensing and communicating the fact that they have flexible bodies. In other words, the idea is that when it comes to, how do I explain this, uh, categorizing or looking at the behavior of plants, we have to take into consideration that their way of being is very different than our way of being Phys physiologically in this case, but not only. Um, so their, their physical nature implies different things. So what we had gone through was we were talking about, you know, the way that they sense, the way they communicate, the way that their bodies are built um what other areas the distinct basically materiality so the the way that plants their capacities and this was a really important aspect of this paper this is the reason why the paper is called the way it is where it's all around um the distinctive capacities of plants because what they wanted us to remember what they're trying to really push towards is the idea that plants have these different capacities and that we have to stop thinking about how plants behave or where plants should behave or how they should behave or any of that kind of stuff based on the idea of anything other than the way that their their capacities themselves give them the ability to do so now we're getting into the part where it's very um specific to this rubber vine and this is the plant kind of the the uh, model plant that these authors have chosen to use. And I think that this is the reason why they're talking about the rubber plant. Obviously, as I've said before, papers that come out of Australia very often have a few um, kind of areas of study that are most important. The invasive species problem, because as we know, um, because Australia was one of the last untouched kind of I islands for a long time and then colonization came and then lots of their flora and fauna also, but we don't care about that right now in this discussion is all oh, has been, um, under siege or has had many different problems. They've lost a lot of species because their ecosystem was very diverse and very dynamic. And, and as we're coming, it was interesting because this morning I was listening to, um, I was listening to something that was talking about kind of like the fact that many of the Native Americans didn't die from um, what we tend to think of just colonial invasion in the sense of getting scalped to death from, you know, some cowboy that wanted new land, although that did happen. But what they also, many of the things that happened were, of course, the diseases that were brought in, the different viruses, the bacteria that their bodies couldn't handle. And this is the same situation. So some of these plants are invasive species in the sense that they've taken over because they entered into lands that they weren't theirs and therefore they find a free-for-all and they do whatever the heck they want so this is where we're going to start to get into the comparisons and what is the point that they're trying to think of in relating to rethinking those capacities of plants so living uh where are we okay here we are sorry i have to set everything up living with or without rubber vine in northern australia we focus on the beings named by scientific taxonomy as uh, Cryptostegia grandiflora. So Cryptostegia, I'm curious as to what crypto means in this particular case, um, and grandiflora, large flower. Uh, our brown, here we go. This is so weird, the way this poop, this paper moves is very strange. Uh, basically the, the rubber vine, a woody perennial in the uh, Apocynaceae, in bio biogeographic terms, rubber vine is endemic to the Madagascar. Huh. Okay. However, its current distribution is attributed to human agency, particularly as part of colonial experiments in rubber plantations. Ah, now I understand how we got there. Like other milkweeds of the Apocyna Apocynaceae, Apocynaceae, yeah, I got it right. Apocynaceae and Asclepidacea. If you're really good at with these terms, I apologize. I know it takes me a while. They eventually, you know how long it took me to learn Arabidopsis, which is like the model plant used in labs. It's in so many papers and I just had to keep reading it over and over and over again. Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis. It just didn't come from my mouth. Anyway, it reminds me of when I was learning Russian. You just had to keep practicing the words over and over again. Um, 
uh, <laughs> rubber vine produces latex, an, an aqueous alkaloid suspension made in living plant cells. More than 20,000 species of mostly tropical plants create latex, which acts to chemically mediate ecological interactions. Providing a coordinated defense mechanism, rubber's vine, rubber vines latex and its secondary metabolic rubber work to reduce herbivory, entrap insects in stickiness, and seal wounds preventing infection. Super useful for them. Colonial efforts to turn rubber vines latex to human purposes for rubber production proved commercially unviable. After experimental sites were abandoned, rubber vine naturalized. Now, just note the word there. Okay, because if you remember our conversation, if you if you remember back to Robin Wall Kimmerer's definition, naturalized becomes a help to the ecosystem. In other words, it enhances the ecosystem. It becomes an active participant. Um, plantain is a naturalized plant. It does not hurt the existing ecosystem or degrade the existing ecosystem, but it adds other characteristics that allow the ecosystem to continue to evolve with plantain's presence, but not where plantain takes over or hurts. I don't know what definition we're going to see here of naturalized, but just keep that keep that as a little piece. Look, I'm even write it myself because I want to keep it because I think this is where we're going. We're looking to define. We're looking to understand. Okay, sorry. Rubber vine naturalized, spreading across extensive areas, including Haiti and southern Florida. Yeah, it's true. Uh, several factors contribute to rubber vines successful spreading. First, it adapts reproduction to conditions. Rubber vine flowers opportunistically with rainfall producing more pods per vine and more flowering events in wetter years. Second, it is prolific producing large seed pods with up to 8,000 seeds per mature plant per reproductive, reproductive event. And third, it uses multiple dispersal methods. Floating pods disperse wild, widely in collaboration with flows of water or wind. I gotta say, man, the, the, those that are able to create like flowing watery um, uh, pod seeds that can actually go through water, I have seen a thousand year old baobab that traveled all the way across from Africa to a Caribbean island. It's amazing. So it's like, what? <laughs> Where are you going with that? How is it that you're able to do it? So water is really powerful, even more than wind in some cases. Uh, see, Beth says, seems to me that a scale is used in discussion of a particular aspect, as in this species or individual falls on point X of the scale or spectrum. I guess it can be used to indicate a point on a hierarchy, but they are very different. And that's an interesting come, come, talking about my scale versus hierarchy question. Yeah, that is a different a different way of thinking about it. Um, I guess we can. Well, well, I mean, I wasn't. Yeah, well, hold on. I, let me think about that because I want to give you a good answer, and I don't want to just do jump from it. Let me let me go back to this, and then I'll go back to your answer because it's a good it's a good good way of thinking about it. In Australia, rubber vine has been recorded since 1875, probably introduced as a garden ornamental into mining camps in Queensland. It quickly became established in areas such as river systems of the Gulf of Carpentaria. It grows on a wide variety of soil types, including saline soils and across savannas, riparian and coastal habitats with rainfall between 400 and 1400 millimeters a year. In Northern Australia, rubber vine has two grow growth habitats. It grows as a freestanding, as freestanding, but also interconnected bushes or shrubs where water is scarce. And along riparian corridors, corridors informs towers of vines from prehensile like whips. I'm trying to visualize that. Oh, interesting. Uh, climbing and smothering and smothering other plants as its vines intertwine to create thick mats spreading across kilometers of canopy. Australian biosecurity strategies target rubber vine as a weed of natural significance. We have an acronym, W-O-N-S, a weed of natural 
of national significance, therefore weed in this case probably being a negative connotation of something we do not want. With its dense growth habit, and, it's and it is considered a threat to biodiversity in woodland and subtropical rainforest environments, including Ramsar wetlands, world heritage areas in Queensland. Rubber vine also poses a significant costs and risks to pastoral, increasing the cost of mustering and reducing pastoral productivity, and tourism in industries, perhaps the real reason for the resources it attracts under invasive species governments programs. Under the WONS program, right, Weeds of National Security, a national priority action framework for each species, including rubber vine, directs funding and guides planning across jurisdictions. For example, in the designation of eradication, containment, and control zones. The nature of Australian federalism in which natural resource management is a state rather than a federal responsibility increases the complexity of the governance challenge and leads to multiple state qualifications and regulatory frameworks for rubber vine and other invasives. We are not necessarily arguing that rubber vine invaded landscapes constitute novel ecosystem as designed by Hobbes. They are, there are many, so this is, they're not arguing necessarily, so maybe they might change their mind. There are many tension inherent in the concept of novel ecosystems, including debate around the issues of invasive inclusions. Richard, so novel ecosystems, newer ecosystems, ecosystems that pop up. Richardson and Gardner argue that invasive plants and novel ecosystems have been too loosely conflated, the former not necessarily producing the threshold changes necessary for the latter. Nevertheless, many widely discussed examples of novel ecosystems contain invasive plants, and there is a live discussion in Northern Australian savanna biogeography about whether invasives, such as gamba grass, are on the verge of triggering a shift to fundamentally transformed ecosystems through their influence on fire regimes. We do argue, however, that rubber vine and other invasives must now be understood both conceptually and in practice as part of the ecology of Northern Australia. Rubber vine now covers an estimated 700,000 hectares across Australia's tropical north and manifest within 35 million hectares or 20% of Queensland. However, the scale of its distribution means that it does not show up in either biome or anthrome, remember anthropomorphic biomes, we talked about this yesterday, last, yesterday, last week, analyses. This region of Northern Australia is part of the tropical grassland, savanna and shrubland biome and the remote rangelands anthrome. Oh, I get that, R rangelands, anthrome, because rangelands means ranging of animals done by, okay, sorry. I you know when the penny drops and you just sort of get it for a second? I, I kind of got it for a second, so it took me a minute. Sorry about that. Invasive species are mapped comprising a relatively small percentage of native species. Clearly, the scale of such analysis needs to be completed by more fine-grained analysis of how the people and the plants interact on the ground, particularly for a plant like rubber vine, which is considered highly problematic. In the following sections, we report results from ethnographic fieldwork with invasive species managers in Northern Australia in the dry seasons of 2011 and 2012, extending from eradication, eradication sites in Northern Western Australia, across the Northern Territories to containment zones in North Queensland. Interviews were undertaken in uh, Kununura, Darwin, Mackay, and near Georgetown in the Gulf of Carpentaria with Gulf with government weed office government weed officers. We could never have in the United States government weed officers because you all know what would be thought. Nobody would think about weeds as in wild plants. Nobody. So, but I love that there is a government weed officer because weeds of national uh, security, right? Like we have national significance, remember? So this is why we have to have government weed officers in Australia. I think that's awesome. It's so awesome. Sorry. And if you're new here, by the way, thank you so much for coming. 
Um, if you're not exactly sure what we're talking about, you can go into Sprout Discussions programs replays and you will find last week's section and you can then look up and, and see the description that gives us an idea of what we're talking about just in case. Although it's going to be fascinating no matter what. So welcome. Okay, scientists, let's get away. This is the diagrams. We're going to get through the diagrams. Okay, oops, sorry, went too far. Indigenous rangers, local and state community environment groups, and two pastoral station managers. Both men and women were well represented. Per participant observation of surveillance, monitoring, erad eradication, and control processes was also undertaken at several sites. The three following subsections reflect themes that emerged from our analysis of field observations and interviews. The capacities we have outlined above as shared among plants are threaded throughout these relations of biosecurity, displaying shifting levels of influence as well as combining with additional capacities of rubber vine. This is the part that I think is the most interesting about this paper in the sense that they've already laid out the capacities that plants have that they are looking at. And again, it's very easy when we're talking about invasive species for us to use human definitions of invasion, right? Based on what we, we as in human beings want to use the land for. So because we have a specific target for what we want to do with this land, we of course have very specific thought processes on whether those behaviors, the behaviors of plants are good or bad based on that. But in this paper, they've gone through and designed differently what is they've they've laid out the capacities of plants and asked ourselves are the definitions that we're using for invasive species or for behaviors and labeling them good bad useful unuseful whatever terms you want to use are we using the right definitions should we instead be looking at the capacities of plants and better understand what's happening and this is an interesting one when they talked before about novel ecosystems right novel ecosystems ecosystems that pop up that are new and so is an invasive species something that can contribute to a novel ecosystem. Going back to my example that I used of plantain, if plantain is there, is nourishing the existing ecosystem, is not taking over, but becomes a partner in that ecosystem, of course, plantain, you would assume, is going to partake in the no any novel ecosystem that gets generated inside of that area. Might even contribute in the sense that it is plantain's um, plantain's presence that helps generate new mutations and changes and evolutions and transformations that contribute to the creation of a novel ecosystem. But is that considered an invasive in the negative connotation that we have of the word invasive, or is that considered evolution? These are kind of the questions that we're pushing for. And so, you know, you can apply those to yourself in different aspects, however you see fit. Okay, appearing, seeing, seeing and sensing. Whereas rubber vine senses its surroundings to move into and around suitable habitats, so managers need to see and sense these movements. Paul has been a federal weed officer. I feel like a teenager. I don't even smoke weed, and yet I can't help the imagery. Okay, I'm going to put myself into an Australian hat, and I'm going to think of weed as wild plants. I am going to use wild plants, actually, because, because I think it's going to help me, and it's going to help us go through this. Sorry, I have my moments when I am just, you know, whatever, a giggly teenager sometimes. Paul has been a federal wild plants officer for the past 20 years, focusing on rubber vine eradication. Okay, so I'm going to redefine wild plants officer to a invasive wild plants officer because it sounds like that's what they're talking about. Focusing on rubber vine eradication at the edge of outlying occurrences within Queensland. Part of his job has been to help state Invasive, we, invasive wild plant officers coordinate their efforts across different jurisdictions. He has also played a significant role in communicating knowledge about rubber vine management to land gro landholder groups. As Paul explains, a rubber vine seed takes about 18 months to germinate and grows to reproductive age when it can flower and set seed again. On the very large, wow, that's pretty fast, 18 months. On the very large properties of the area, this short window of time provides little opportunity for pastoralists to take notice, let alone mobilize resources to manage rubber vine. As Paul puts it, they can't see it at the moment, 
The combination of relatively quick reproductive capacity and remote location makes it difficult for Paul to undertake an effective weed awareness program. In most cases, once landholders or managers detect plants, rubber vine has exceedingly has exceeded the outbreak or outlier category. It suddenly creeps up on you, and then you can then can only be managed under more pragmatic control programs. Conversely, climbing vine entanglement takes place over a longer time span. Time scale. Daryl, a previously a district ergonomist in Victoria, made his tree change to the Queensland Gulf with his family over 30 years ago. Daryl's description illustrates the slow process of rubber vine growing in and then over and then over standing trees and other vegetation, then over standing trees and other vegetation. This process is so insidious that it took his fresh eyes to really notice. And I see this a lot, like even uh, Gary the Silver Fur at the very bottom has a, um, was, I was about to use the word in Italian, an ivy infestation. And here you see it a lot in these areas. So I think this is probably a very similar equivalent, which is that ivy starts to grow from the base of the tree, starts to crawl up the trunk of the tree. And then eventually when it reaches the top of a tree will then spread out over the canopy. So it first starts from the trunk, then over the canopy. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this in many other locations over the canopy. And then once it's over the canopy, it will completely engulf the tree. And at some point the tree will probably lose its life. While the heather is the, the heather, not the heather, the ivy is still at the bottom and is starting to grow up, there is a space for a balance. And depending how the ecosystem is in that particular temperate forest is, can actually manage and keep that balance in place. But when there is an imbalance and the ivy takes over, forget it, you know, those trees are toast, that parasite no longer becomes a productive member of the ecosystem, but instead takes over of everything and knocks and starts to kill off trees. I wonder if this is kind of similar where, you know, the rubber tree has a phase where it's like, ah, oh, we barely see because there's just growing up a little bit. And then pff, all, you know, everything's taken over anyway. Um, in the riparian zones at two meters high, there's a tree, it rubber vine key rubber vine can climb. It might take 10 to 15 years to get up there and it's just slowly climbing and not doing much. And then eventually it gets to the top because it loves sunlight, needs sunlight, and it might be two or three little vines that have done this over time. Now, once they get up there and they've got their castle to sit on, they just explode and the weight of the rubber vine plant starts to break the little branches out of the tree. The top of the tree then takes it out, then takes out the bigger branches, and then it starts to seriously damage the crown of the tree. And that's usually, I say, it's around the 40 year mark, 40 years to do this from a, from a tree that can like pretty much start to exist after 18 months from experience. There's nothing clever about it. It's just the fresh eyes, I think. And I would see changes occurring and the people that live there would go, oh yeah, maybe it's changed a bit. And I'm thinking, no, when we came up here in 82, I know that the river system was clean, you know, and there was no fringing vegetation. And 10 years later, it's gone, two or 300 yards out into the open land. This is Daryl talking about this. In the north of Western Australia, weed officers have been so far successfully eradicating small outbreaks of rubber vines for more than 15 years. The latest detection was made by pastoral station manager, Bob, who noticed the purple flowers and arching wisps of a lone plant just 200 meters from the homestead yards. Bob's vigilance for rubber vine was honed during previous work in Queensland. His keen eye and a few phone calls quickly mobilized weed officer Trudy, as well as Paul and Queensland and the multi-agency team of weed management staff rangers. Does this sound like, like, a, like a TV series to anybody else? I mean, I could totally see this being a television series. Like, let's call Trudy. And then Trudy's going to call Paul. And Paul's going to go get Daryl. And Daryl are going to go over there and just do something about this rubber vine. <laughs> That's awesome. I totally could see this. Let's pitch this as a new series. During our go-along interview, Bob plunged into chest-high grass to show us the single plant. In fact, the vine he was to show us had been had been dead after treatment for over a month. It was shriveled and barely discernible from the shrub it had been growing over, except to Bob, who pointed out its distinctive spotted purplish stem. 
Humans need a particular kind of mobility to do their sensing of rubber vine well. Although 4WD vehicles, quad bikes, and boats are, are all used in weed management, in some areas, helicopters are the only means of gaining access. Seriously, this is a television show. In particularly remote areas, provisions for a number of days or weeks are flown into a surveillance-based location. Although there are particular risks and higher costs with helicopter biosecurity, the areas that can be covered by a small group makes it, cost, makes it a cost-effective option. Moreover, particular weeds, including rubber vine, are more easily seen from above, from a low-flying helicopter, than from below in a vehicle. It is from the air that the characteristic towers of rubber vines are most easily seen as showy displays of purple flowers and or shiny new leaves against duller background vegetation. However, this is not a straightforward task. Younger plants may not flower heavily for the first two or three years, and so may not be visible until they have matured and already set seed. Very large areas may need to be assessed if infestations are sparsely distributed, and it takes an experienced set of eyes to know what to look for. Spotting rubber vine from helicopters is a learned skill and takes practice in different light conditions. Paul describes this process. You get a feel for things at certain times. It's the sun was coming from behind you, shining through that canopy. You'd be able to pick out, well, you'd be able to go and say, hang on, yeah, shiny leaf. Yeah, it looks characteristic. Let's go, yeah, let's, let's come over to this site. Interviewer, so there's nothing else that might be confused with it. Oh, there's quite a few other native plants that you can get very confused with, but the distinct characteristics, I guess, this is what we sort of picked up was like was about timing in terms of the seasonal conditions you time your surveys to suit the conditions on site for instance if they had rain now you might do a survey in six or eight weeks then obviously the leaf arrangement and that leaf display just being a plain green leaf in quite glossy and how it sits on the canopy as well who knew who knew there was so much to think about relating to being a weed officer Digital devices operated in the air by the weed spotters allow for detected plants to be mapped and gridded. Weed officer Trudy, Trudy commonly uses the software Aussie Explore. To, I'm sorry, it's just literally, I want a television show on this. Like I would totally sit and watch this, wouldn't you? Would you sit and watch a television show about how Aussie X, like weed management goes out and explores because of weeds of, of national surveillance like seriously i would i would totally i would totally watch this totally watch this especially when they're using software called aussie explorer look i know that probably for the australians this might be normal stuff but for us outside of it where i i am just loving these words exactly thank you beth beth would watch this with me she and i would be sitting around drinking, eating popcorn watching this Okay, uh, aided by GPS running in the helicopter cab. I mean, seriously, if you think about it, I mean, if we think about this, the approach that Michael Pollan has about plants, about the idea that plants are maybe grooming us and take, think about how much money are these plants are making us spend on things like helicopters and four, four wheel drive vehicles and quads and all kinds of stuff just to see where they're growing, how they're growing, and if they're growing the way we want them to be growing. I mean, this is like radical rebellion 101. I think that there should be an equally attentive group of people that are studying these plants to understand how to launch a very successful rebellion and movement. How do you, I mean, I mean, I hate to say this. No, I'm not going to say it. But yes, I'm going to say it. I think that if we were looking at strategies for military interventions, like watching plants and how they invade a species, I mean, an area would probably be good. So let's hope that they never figure that out so that nobody ever has to give the military. This is like the secrets that we should never give any kind of military because it's just, they're, they're just too good at this. But plants will always be better. They're just smarter at landscaping, at like looking at a landscape and knowing where to go and how to do this. Um, once the plan has been identified, a plan for managing and surveillance of each outbreak is quickly put into place. Weed officers now manage, visit, and threat, and treat, not threat, visit and treat 24 sites along these rivers as part of their annual work plan, using various devices to enhance their own sensing, 
seeing and sensing capacities. These plant managers are thus responding to the particular materiality and mobilities of rubber vine. So remember we were talking before, how do plants sense their environment? How do they see their environment? How do they um, explore the environment? By the way, a very positive use of this that has been done is there is a model for a series of plantoids, which are plant-based robots that have been developed for um, space, travel, not space travel, excuse me, space exploration. So the idea that today many of the rovers that we have, actually all the rovers that we have that go into places like Mars and the moon and such are all developed on the idea of a somewhat humanoid technology or of a cart, right? The idea you have these carts with, um, with uh, wheels and so they go off and then they drop little things that pick up stuff from the ground. But seriously, what is the most potent organism on the planet when it comes to exploring new terrains? Plants. So if you were to use a root-based system, the idea of instead ever elongating roots that go out from the core seed that is the central processing piece or the containment piece, right, that go out with tendrils that come out that are ever growing, that can grow, and also in this case can like self-heal. There's a lot of models to how they explore air quality, how they explore, you know, the ground, how they explore the surface. These are all things that plants do on a regular basis. So the idea that our rovers are based on cart-like technologies is makes no sense. And the idea that we should maybe look into and that has been developed in prototypes of a different, completely different type of system that uses plants as inspiration. It's a it's a form of biomimicry that's that's fascinating to see if you ever have a chance to go look at. I believe the project is called Plantoids. And I don't know where it is right now, but several years ago, I know that it was being experimented in the European Space Agency to see how it could be developed so that you have this idea of a root tip that's constantly then growing from the root tip. So it doesn't grow from the device, from the center core, but instead grows out from the root tip, very similar to the way that a plant would do it, as an aside. So it's not all military. There's lots of other positive ways of exploration and of cleaning up and understanding if I'm cleaning up areas, like today we use phytoremediation in order to clean up uh, toxic areas using live plants, but we also could create devices that do that kind of cleanup that are plant-like in nature and that explore land. The same, there's just so many applications that can be when we start to really understand the way plants sense their environment. Um, so using various devices to enhance their own seeing and sensing cap capacities. Remember we talked in the beginning, we talked last week about the idea of how is it that plants sense and see. So therefore that we can create things that are in harmony with these plants rather than wasting lots of money and human effort in the idea of trying to understand what the plant is trying to do using a, a, a logic that is human because we, we all know that doesn't work. Um, these plant managers are thus responding to materiality and mobilities of rubber vine, the creeping presence in the landscape, like the, glo the gloss of a leaf. These responses involve considerable skill and accumulation of detailed knowledge of the plant, as well as the broader landscape. They must be maintained over temporal cycles that intersect with the plant's life cycle to be effective. Entangling with others, in the process of embedding itself among other plants and eventually becoming a local dominant vegetation, rubber vine forms relationships with other non-humans, including animals. Clever, clever. Arthur, let's introduce Arthur into our series. This is episode two. Uh, a local district weed officer in the containment zone in Queensland described at length how feral pigs and wallabies forage out on the grassy plains during the day and then shelter underneath the matted vines at night. According to Arthur, the wallabies have now successfully bred into very large populations, completely displacing smaller mammals such as bandicoots and patamelon. Patamelons, so cute. Additionally, pigs, numbering in their millions, root around beneath the vines during the wet season when the ground is soft, discouraging grass growth. The, these constant disturbances, pro, pro, this constant disturbance processes promote the spread of rubber vine together with other weed species such as neem. Ah, really? 
Yeah, I thought about that. Creating new forest associations among remnant eucalyptus open woodland. Associations that can slow the movement of water and promote sediment de deposition along the Gilbert and Inesle rivers. Hopefully I said that right. Stock have also changed their behavior with rubber vines presence. Keenly aware that it helps them elude mustering, Bob recounts tales of his rubber vine experiences in Queensland, herding cattle on horseback under massive infestations so dense that it was impossible to herd stock by helicopter. Because you herd stock by helicopter? Oh, wow. I am ignorant to these practices. Bob described to us a number of times when he had chased cattle into the rubber vine only to be pulled from the saddle to the ground by the thick twisting mass of whipping stems. Seriously, I want, I want a television show. We <laughs> Daryl had similar experiences. We don't like to admit it, but sometimes they, the cattle in this case, don't like us. I wonder why, Daryl. I wonder and they disappear into the rubber vines. They're like, screw you, I'm going into the rubber vines where you can't come get me. Virtually impossible to push the horse through, maybe because you should walk through it and like walk a mile in their shoes. And if you've got scrubber bulls, it's, scrubber bulls, excuse me, it's dangerous. Well, yeah, it is dangerous on the ground. The boys can get them out, but they've got to know what they're doing and they need to be experienced. So yeah, it can create mustering problems. I'm sorry, but at what point do you ask yourself why these problems exist? Like, what is it that I'm doing to treat these cattle that they don't like me and run away from me? Look, I'm a meat eater. I'm very honest about that, but there are ways, like there are ways, there are ways, there are ways to do this differently. Maybe the question you should be asking yourself is different than whether or not it's rubber vines fault that has given the cattle shelter or whether there's something about your practices that maybe don't create a lot of interspecies, you know, relations. Just the thought process, just the thought. In the tangle of vines, where does one plant begin and another end? For these managers, the mass of individual plants come becomes the collective they have to deal with. And in contrast with other experiences in the eradication zone where spotting rubber vines, individuals provide the management focus. This whole, every time I read the word eradication zone, I start to think about why we're moving towards like this, uh, uh, why so many movies have an apocalyptic sort of vision of the future because we have things like eradication zones and we're okay with these words. Oh, this would be a very interesting television show. Latex as shifting mediator. Depending on the density of infestation, different combinations of chemical, mechanical, biological, and fire control techniques are used to manage rubber vine. I swear it sounds like a war. And I guess in their minds, it is a war. It really is. I thought this part would go faster, but I'm just like constantly halted by all of this imagery. Maybe I'm just naive and ignorant about this. I'm sure that I am not the right person who's qualified to talk about the validity of all these things. But I have to say that just the vocabulary is terrifying. Terrifying, terrifying. It is possible to burn rubber vine from the ground, but do for large and remote properties, burning can also be done from the air. We observed air, I'm sorry. We observed aerial burning demonstrations on two properties in the control zone in the Gulf of Carpentaria in or Carpentaria, I guess it may be, in the late June 2012. The targets for the burn were rubber vine towers on interchannel islands along the seven kilometer stretch of the Inesley River. Each tower, a once mature eucalyptus tree, now standing dead. Yeah, that's kind of sad or collapsing under the weight of smothering vine. Unfortunately. Arthur explained that the aims of these demonstrations were to restore river access for the owner's cattle. Arthur explained that the aims of these demonstrations were to restore river access to the owner's cattle. 
not the eucalyptus trees. I'm moving on. But no, this is hard. As well, as well as to convince landholders of the cost and labor efficiencies of this technique, because they're cattle. Aerial igni ignition burning allows managers to target rubber vine towers and is an adaptation of a bushfire management technique, whereas a heliotorch, uh, sorry, I just lost something. Uh, a heli torch, excuse me, is used to back burn ahead of an unmanaged fire front. For burning, gelling agents are mixed with petroleum to create a low flash point, high volatility fuel slung in a heli torch below a helicopter. This gelled petroleum ignites at 320 degrees Celsius, but for rubber vine management, the aim is to burn when vegetation fuel loads and weather conditions will heat the fire to above 600. Oops, excuse me. The point at which the latex in the rubber vine will ignite and kill the plant. <sighs> I understand that fire to a certain extent is an absolutely necessary part of management. Okay. Please don't think doesn't, doesn't mean I, I like hearing this, but I understand it's need. Well, maybe not the need of the way that they're doing it and the reasons for which they're doing it, but I understand the overall concept of why fire management is good. Early in the morning, we met Arthur and now there's Craig, meet Craig, the helicopter pilot on Arthur's back veranda over coffee. Never had a paper that I've seen where they talk about just sitting around, shooting the shit over coffee. Annotated topographic maps were spread across the table. The entrance gates and mixing site were circled and the sites to be treated along the river channel noted. Arthur had checked the weather forecast and judged it to be pretty good. <laughs> the relative humidity was just, oh, excuse me, lower than the temperature making it safe enough to burn. There was no mention of eradication. The bushy rubber vine sitting away from the river was not to be targeted. The more open structure makes them difficult to burn and setting fires to those further from the river also runs the risk that the fire will escape and burn valuable pasture. Because that's what's important, the pasture that's valuable. Preparation work, this paper started off so good talking about like all of these amazing properties of plants and now it's just a reason for them to figure out how to burn them well. Preparation work for the burn. Okay, I'm not going to read all of this about the burn um, because it is too much. Uh, so they watched Craig maneuver the chopper, chopper around the Tower of Vines, plumes of smoke, fuel canisters, screaming vines. After the burn was complete, we flew with Craig along the river line, visible in the distance by rising smoke threaded along it. Although still smoking, the fires were essentially out. Very little surrounding vegetation had burnt, but the thick basil stems of, of targeted rubber vine were burnt through and everything on top would now die off. Aren't you happy? A helicopter and hundreds of liters of potentially explosive fuel. So is the only reason you're killing this because of the cattle? I still haven't seen another reasoning. If you have another reasoning, I mean, I am all for the idea of invasive species that literally take over and kill the eucalyptus trees. Like this is not good from the perspective of it's an introduced species that doesn't find a home. Killing off these eucalyptus trees doesn't have a purpose in the overall ecosystem in which they're in. So there's no balance being created. So therefore I am all a big fan of like, you know, telling that part of the rubber vine, hey dude, like this ain't gonna work. So you need to back off or we're going to kill you off. I'm getting that part. And I do get that the idea that a certain amount of animals need to be able to live and they can't create this like huge space. I'm good with all of these, but everything they're talking about is eradication because of cattle ranchers, not even the cattle themselves because the cattle runs into it. So that means the cattle can survive with them. The cattle would probably eat parts of it too. Car eat key, keep a little bit of balance. This is cattle ranchers. Okay. I'm, I'm going to see if there's anything else that you're going to tell me here that's good. William, now we have William. William, an ecologist who's been studying the effects of this burning approach over the past three years, explained later that the key is in understanding the conditions and how they will interact with late, latex. So this is all about how to create a great, I like that. You don't need a raging inferno to kill it. Whew. 
Ooh, okay, so this is all about killing. This is all about killing. We later learned that the owner was happy with the aerial burning. Oh, thanks. So happy to hear that. All right, I'm, I'm jumping through. Rubber vine capacities and agencies. Okay, here's the agency of rubber vine, hopefully coming back into the conversation. Rubber vine illustrates the lively capacities shared by plants, and it does so by its own specific ways. It takes varied bodily forms, energized by its capacity and need to eat the sun. It lives and takes shape in ways beyond relations with humans, for example, in producing latex that pr protects from herbivory, enlisting wind and water to aid its dispersal, or creating the branching whips by which it grows, entwines and spreads. Rubber vine moves without humans at scales from, a la from the landscape to individual branches. It spreads across zones, pulls people off horses, I can, I can I can see that a little bit fun and I can see the cattle saying thank you for pulling the people off horses <laughs> provides refuge for animals and I'll get another thank you it senses and responds with various parts of its body the agency of the plant is clear rubber vine is not passive <laughs> the variety of practices demonstrated here show that people already engage with rubber vine as a subject it is read as a threat and is implicitly recognized through the need to legislate. Who's it a threat to? It's a threat maybe to the eucalyptus because there's not a lot of them. And so that's a threat, but the cattle like them. And so do the little animals. It is read as a threat and is implicitly recognized through the need to legislate both as part of a group invasive species and as a named individual species in the weed of national surveillance. Humans and other, is it surveillance? Surveillance, sur security, I don't remember what the S was for. Humans and other animals live with rubber vine, adjusting their lives and strategies while also working to affect rubber vine manifestations. This particular plant has just transformed biosecurity practices in very specific ways urging on the use of helicopter searches and fire, for instances. From the human perspective, the management strategy is also only possible with exceptional skill and technology. So it really makes you work for it in very particular places. These practices are not used against other weeds because they would not be effective. The difference of rubber vines from other plants are clear. Burning as a management practice, la di la di la. Hold on, sorry. I'm trying to figure out what you're trying to tell me here. The pragmatic human response to the relationship also recognizes that long-term victory is not possible if conceived only as eradication. Eradic eradication. Can't get rid of them. Can't get rid of them. Can't get rid of them. Rather, the plant's resistance to invasive plant management is acknowledged. You've won, rubber plant. You run. Is, is it bad that I'm cheering on the invasive species in this case? Because it bothers me so much that the only reason you are talking about it or the way that you're talking about it is because they kill off space for cattle. Like, and from the perspective of cattle as in like, not, oh, I'm so worried about the cattle. You're not worried about the cattle. You're worried about your money with the cattle. Instead, from the human point of view, the relationship is about setting priorities, protecting assets, and adapting to the plants. Our argument, yes, you have to adapt to the plant. Our argument is not that rubber vine stands for all invasive plants, nor that invasive plants stand for all plants in discussing relations with humans. We have drawn attention to the differences of rubber vines from other plants and how these differences have drawn specific human biosecurity responses. However, there are some constraints, consistent trends. As an assignee to the category invasive plants, rubber vine illustrates some of the contradictions these plants pose to human understandings of plant mobility and sensing. When acting as invasive, plants are understood to be not only mobile, but aggressively so, marching across whole landscapes. In the process, they marshal a range of sensing and communicative cap cap uh, capacities. Their agency is clear, but unwelcome, are, uh, and resisted on using practices of killing. Further, our account of rubber vines capacities demonstrates the interplay between a sense of plants as objects, things to kill, burn, study, and subjects, active participants in the landscape and in biosecurity. That reflects challenges to the subject-object dualism in some more than human work. There is much scope for that thinking to further consider plants. Yes, lots of, much, much scope. We, we need to rethink this whole thing. Because you've already acknowledged that victory is not possible. So what the hell is
are you doing? <laughs> like, haven't you ever thought that maybe we should just throw the whole plan out and like look at it completely different? Thinking about what do we create a different relationship with rubber plants, with rubber vine at this point? Let's see what their conclusions are. We have argued that it is timely for geographers to more system systematically explore the differences and similarities of plants enacted with other beings. Drawings on recent botanical understandings, we have conceptualized the capacities of plants as shared and differentiating, predating human and changing in interaction with them. We outline these capacities as including a particular materiality, mobility, without human, human, without human, oops, excuse me, went too far, intervention, sensing and communicating and taking shape as flexible bodies. To be clear, we do not consider these or any other qualities to be intrinsic. They are themselves relational. Relations can solidify into particular forms and processes and endure over evolutionary and shorter timescales. They can also be destroyed apply to humans just as much as plants. So part of the value of such an approach is that it helps us reflect on our own ways of living and not knowing. Okay, the very beginning of this is really, okay, sorry, my, what the heck is, what, man, what is happening here? Somebody has decided to completely start to ding in my computer and it's driving me nuts. Okay, sorry. The whole beginning part of this was really good and like plants are have all these other things and we were looking at them in different ways and now that we're recognizing who they are wow how interesting. Now the end you were kind of going back to this like maybe we need to rethink everything the middle sucks. <laughs> I mean I guess it's because it's the practices of today and we're seeing what's happening but so it's so frustrating. As Cohn argued the reason this work matters is not just that it gives voice agency or subjectivity to the non-human to recognize them as others visible in their difference but that it forces us to radically rethink these categories of our analysis as they pertain to all things. I like that. Plants challenge thinking about agency and subjectivity against the human norm. In contrast to many animals, plants are so different from us that we are not at risk of confusion. The point is not that plants possess agency, but that they enact distinctive agencies, sun eating, mobile, communicative, and flexible collective. So far in the context of invasive plants, human engagement with such agencies shows an interplay between object and subject, depending on the circumstance. Rubber vine has helped ground conceptualization, not that each capacity is highlighted in a way that can be listed, but each is involved and several are particularly prominent. Rubber vine forces us to rethink the individual in a tangle of vines where one plant begins and another ends is not always obvious. It manifests as two very different bodily collective and demonstrates strong agency in both. It is highly mobile, spreading unseen and, or undetected, adapting its reproduction and overtaking other plants. People interact with it as an adversary, a problem to be eradicated, a species to be regulated, an impediment to mustering and, non, and a non-native. Smaller categories under the umbrella of plant, tree, species, seed, invasive, have also have unshared capacities that must be examined in empirical specifics. We have shown how they are brought to bear in the wider set of relations that constitute the management of rubber vine as an invasive plant in Northern Australia. We have traced the differences that non-human differences make in the environmental governance of biosecurity. If plants were understood, not just as things that can or should be done to, but rather things, maybe not things is the best word, beings that act back in partnership and conflict, policy would and should look rather different. Summary of most important part of this entire paper. <laughs> Policymakers can first learn from the experience of practitioners on the, this is very similar. I know I don't have a lot of time. I know we're at the end of our time and I have to run to another meeting, but this is very similar to Robin Wall Kimmerer and her talking about, uh, not Robin Wall Kimmerer, excuse me, Susan Simard and her looking at foresty practices and saying we should modify our forestry um, practices based on the idea that plants are, that these trees are uh, alive, aware, and have agency in and of themselves. Policy would could first learn from the experience of practitioners on the ground where, as our empirical, oops, excuse me, Parical results show people are very conscious of plant cap capacities and affordances. We have extended previously work on conviviality and mutual flourishing by focusing on an adversarial example. In fact, the ethics of death and killing are never far from the human plant relations, whether it is weeding, eating, biosecuring, or harvesting. In this way, planty capacities have much to offer ethical discussions. Yes, 
by taking us beyond the avoidance of death as the preferred baseline. In the rubber vine example, humans have become very attentive to the ways in which these plants live and proliferate, as well as altering their own practices in order to become more effective killers. Rubber vine is also a killer of other plants and animals. So it is necessary then to think explicitly about killing and killability. I'm with you on that. I am not saying we should never kill. On the contrary, I'm saying we need to find a different, different relationship, but in very different ways from a moral existentialism. Extensionism, the argument in which human sentience or consciousness remains the, remains the yardstick. Uh, the combination of ethnographic approaches and methods of botanical sensing used in this paper has by no means broken free of the magnetic attraction of the human core. We recognize the epistemological tension in, the, in our case study in that we have approached human rubber vine relations through the human lens. Yes, only human lens. There is an important conversation to be had about whether we can do otherwise, and much more work is needed in this area. Maybe try writing another paper from the vine's point of view. We consider this tension to be a productive one. The scale of our approaches, bodily local, bodily local grounded, offers an important way to analyze the intricacies of practices and relations within anthromes. It thus helps heal the traditional biogeographic disconnect between the invisibility of invasives with biomes, yet their conceptualization as continental invaders. We as researchers like Invasive, like invasive plant practitioners need to expand our way of sensing in order to gain further insights into plant worlds. Okay, Whew. They, they, yeah, they made up, they made up, okay? That was a much better ending than I expected. Um, middle part, very, very hard. I have to run, unfortunately. I um, Today we have our first mini discussion on Thus Spoke the Plant in the book club, and I am already three minutes late to that, but that is okay. We wanted to finish this paper, and I am so excited that we did because it really took us into a completely different direction. So with that said, I will write up a little summary when I post this recording. If you're watching the recording, thank you, thank you so much for being here. And for those of you that were here live, thank you. I am, I have a lot to think about now and I would love for them to write another paper from the rubber vines point of view. I think it would be a great exercise and one that will show them that maybe all of the things that they're doing kind of maybe could change. Let's just say it that way. Anyway. Thank you again for being here. We will be back next Friday. I will be back, not we. I'm a global we. I'll be back next Friday for another paper. I'm, uh, I'm excited to see what's going to come up next. And until then, remember to resist the urge to hold back your evolving green brilliance. This diggity, I'm out. Bye.